News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notes Notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It's 9pm, I'm Patrick Christie's Tonight. A GB News exclusive, a new way lawyers could exploit our asylum system to cost you millions. Also... Incident from Monday 22nd of March must also be investigated from a criminal perspective. Yes. Extremists force people to move house, lose their jobs and their bank accounts. Has Britain surrendered to the mob? And is our government hiding how many immigrants and asylum seekers are in prison for violent and sexual offences? Nigel Farage is on that. Plus... New Pampers are Punami proof with a revolutionary stop and protect pocket to help prevent leaks at the back. So you'll never fear a Punami again. Should parents be banned from sending their children to school wearing nappies? And is it OK to torture terror suspects like the Russians? I've got all of tomorrow's newspapers today with my panellists, top columnist Carol Malone, trade unionist Andy MacDonald and Daily Express political editor Sam Lester. And I'll reveal what on earth is happening here. Get ready, Britain. Here we go. It's time to kick the extremists out of Britain. Next. First, the news at one minute past nine and our top story tonight. The Deputy Prime Minister accused China today of being responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting the Electoral Commission. Databases containing the names and addresses of 40 million registered voters were visible to Chinese hackers in 2021 and 2022, but the government says it didn't affect the outcome of local elections at the time. Oliver Dowden also said that national cyber security 
support will help political parties make sure they're protected from foreign influence in the run-up to the election. This is the latest in a clear pattern of hostile activity originating in China, including the targeting of democratic institutions and parliamentarians in the United Kingdom and beyond. Oliver Dowden. Now, the former ISIS bride Shamima Begum has lost her initial bid to challenge the removal of her British citizenship at a Supreme Court. Miss Begum left the UK nine years ago at the age of 15 to travel to Syria and join the Islamic State terror group. Her citizenship was taken away in 2020. Last year, Miss Begum lost her first appeal against the decision to revoke her citizenship on national security grounds at the Special Immigration Appeals Commission. She had asked the Court of Appeal for permission to take her case to the Supreme Court, but it has now been refused. In the United States, Donald Trump will go on trial next month, the first ever criminal trial of a former or current US president. Separately, he scored a significant victory after an appeals court judge granted him an extension to pay a fine in 10 days' time, also reducing his liability from £360 to £140 million. It means that New York state authorities can't now seize his assets in a fraud case, during which he's been accused of inflating his net worth. Republicans' overseas spokesperson Jennifer Ewing told GP News earlier that Mr Trump's legal challenges are having a positive effect on his popularity in the polls. With each one, Trump's numbers went up, right? So people do not care about this. They know that Donald Trump, especially in this case, has been one of the most well-known real estate moguls in New York City for half a century. Um, nothing like this has ever been brought up. Uh, he ran for president, as we know. Nothing like it was brought up during his presidency. And so now when he decides to run again, this is coming out. Jennifer Ewing. Those are the latest news stories. To sign up for GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. All right, it is 9pm. It's time to crack on. The extremists were at the gates. We let them in and then we let them win. It's time to fight back. If you feel too scared to talk about certain topics for fear of repercussions to you and your loved ones, you are not alone. Dame Sarah Khan has identified the rise of freedom-restricting harassment in a damning report highlighting threats to the UK's social cohesion. Here are the facts. 85% of the public believe freedom-restricting harassment occurs in the UK. 60% believe it's worse than five years ago. 76% self-censor in public to protect themselves or loved ones. 69% feel people are having to censor the way they live their professional or personal lives due to freedom-restricting harassment. Of the 27% who say they've experienced life-altering harassment, get this, 20% have come off social media, 17% have increased security measures, 15% have changed jobs, 13% have even moved house. The Islamists are top of the extremism chart. The fact is that people will censor what they think about hardline elements of the Muslim community because there is only one major religion operating in the UK right now that comes with a death sentence for any critics. The report gives several examples. Bally Grammar School. The school, the police and the local council didn't know how to behave in the face of a baying mob. They suspended the teacher, who is still in hiding and suffering from PTSD, didn't make any arrests, even when the mob turned up at his house, and they openly said that they behaved the way they did because they wanted to maintain links with the Muslim co community. Extremists are overthrowing our political system. The local government association says 90% of councillors have received abuse and intimidation. 68% of those are not seeking re-election. They say it's because of the abuse. A female council leader had received thousands of death threats and individuals had threatened to gang rape and traffic her two-year-old daughter, whom she makes sleep with a fire blanket after a fellow councillor had their house firebombed. Could it be because of stuff like this? Why does no motion be put to this chamber? We were told that we, if they would be happy, the Labour group would be happy to put a motion to this chamber. Why has that not happened? Because it's I not bloody Gaza. Dudes, go on. 
We know MPs have faced threats. That's why we had a botched ceasefire vote. But just today, Philip Davies in Shipley had a mob turn up at his office. He looks like a broken man, bless him. They'll come after your business too. You could just own a kebab shop that supports Palestine but was selling Coca-Cola, which is apparently a Zionist monster in a can. He was battered. It's interesting because the old mad mullers aren't too afraid to censor themselves, are they? He's sitting next to a guy who's going to go and penetrate and sodomize another guy tonight. And you're going you're to expect a lot to give you victory. Why aren't they afraid? Maybe it's because our entire political, police and legal framework protects them, not us. Forget fear of speaking out. Sometimes we're too afraid to go out. Here's James Cleverly wishing everyone a very happy Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. And at this time of celebration, I'd like to say a big thank you to the counter-terrorism police who have been working all year round to keep us safe. If you're out and about and you see something that just doesn't look right, makes you feel uncomfortable, is just out of place, let the police know. We're changing our way of life because of extremism. But it's not just Islamism. There's the trans mafia. An artist simply said she didn't think children should be given puberty blockers and she was booted out of her own art exhibition. A teacher was allegedly sacked for refusing to use a child's preferred pronouns. Police Scotland have apparently recorded a hate incident against a serving Tory politician because he said choosing to identify as non-binary is as valid as choosing to identify as a cat. But you're about to be censored in your own home. Staying in Scotland now, Hamza Yusuf is keen to pass a law that would criminalise speech in your house. So if you had Christmas dinner and your nan said something about channel migrants that offended her woke 17-year-old granddaughter, then the police could come round, the family would have to snitch on each other and nan ends up in handcuffs. If you have the wrong views, you'll also be debanked. 340,000 people had their bank accounts closed last year, reportedly. They were given little to no warning. And as Nigel Farage found, that could very easily just be because they didn't subscribe to modern, woke, progressive views. Today, it's emerged that Keir Starmer's net zero plans could cost us all £117 billion. But don't you dare speak out against it, just in case this lot turn up outside your house. You might want to know, I'm also breaking the East bail. Um, I've got bail not to go to any MP's house. Um, I don't know if you want to, like, follow up on that, considering, as you can see, like, that was our only intention. Look, who's doing the harassing, OK? Islamists, eco-lunatics, radical progressives and the trans mafia. I am sick and tired of these reports telling us what we already know. The solution isn't to set up a buffer zone to stop seemingly unemployed Islamic fanatics from protesting outside of school, for example. No. The solution is arrest, where possible, deport, tell them to shut up and go home, and definitely never, ever surrender. Britain has had enough of this rubbish. But let's get the thoughts now of my panel. I am joined this evening by the star columnist Carol Malone. I have got trade unionist Andy MacDonald and political editor at the Daily Express. It's Sam Lister. Carol, are the extremists winning? Yeah, of course they're winning. Yeah, you know, we have a government uh, and a police force that, that are cowed by them. You know, we've got to a point now where... There are subjects in this country that we can't talk about anymore. Islam is one of them. Um, diversity is one of them. Um, the other one is transgenderism. And, and anyone who speaks out about those things is, you know, is, you know, is slated, threatened, abused. You know, we have, we have organisations where you're no-platformed, where you're threatened. You mentioned that horrific case of that, that lady councillor mm. who's... Who these these idiots threatened to gang rape her daughter? I mean, God Almighty, what kind of moron do you have to be to do that to someone? And and I just think you know where free speech is, is now under threat. You know, we are no longer a free country. It's not a free country where a woman can be punched in the face and physically assaulted because she dares to criticise or question gender ID. It's not a free country when people are scared to. Work express their views and their opinions on a whole host of things. So we're not living in a free country anymore. And, and that has been happening gradually and gradually, and it's been happening mm. because the authorities and the government are too scared to do anything about it. Well, Andy, I understand you don't think that the extremists are winning. 
I don't think they're winning, but I think that an environment has been built over you know the last however many years that they, they could win if nothing is done about it. I think that there have been consistent domestic policy failures. You know, it was outlined outlined quite clearly in the Khan review that the social cohesion policy has failed. It's been seen as something that's nice to have but not essential. Social cohesion policy is essential. I think genuinely we're at that kind of point where we're getting to the point of no return that if we don't implement Matt, the recommendations of this. Did you listen to all the examples in his intro that he just, he just gave us? I did. Well, not getting to the point. Well, way past well, the point. Uh, the, uh, and I think those examples are absolutely abhorrent and I condemn them entirely as a normal person would. But Pity they're, the not, they're not everyday uh, situations. I think if they were winning, it yes, would be every day. Situations every day we're reading stories about people being no platformed who who are being. There's a difference between being no platformed yes, and having off, horrific you threats start against off at you. No platform, and you go right up to what happened to that teacher and. Mm. Yeah, uh, uh, Sam, I'll come to you now. So, 75% of the public feel they have to refrain from speaking their mind. 27% have changed their way of life, whether it's employing security, to moving jobs, or even moving house. It's damning. It's astonishing. I mean. People actually having to move house because of intimidation and threats. Uh, I think the problem is, though, although we have a Conservative government and have had for 14 years, the problem all started way, way, way before that under the Blair era and the ide ideological capture of our institutions. Mm. So, essentially, now you're playing whack-a-mole. Every time a bit of guidance uh, is criticised for being ridiculous. Uh, another bit of guidance will pop up in another NHS department, for example, or the BBC will take a, a, another bizarre approach to something. So you, you, you're constantly having to kind of chase this um, lunacy yeah. uh, round and round and round and round the clock because in the institutions themselves, the people who are running them are so gripped by this need yeah. to be kind, which actually ends up... Um, doing anything but. So, yeah. you know, when you have politicians, you know this in your job, when you have politicians told that abuse and death threats are now part of their job, it's astonishing. I mean, yeah. that, that's, it, it should not be part of their job. You know, how many... What kind of calibre of politicians are we going to get in the future if if we know that everyone who comes into politics is going to get death threats? You get idiots like those people turning up at your front door at home. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and the cops are negotiating with those protesters. Move them away from the politician's door. Don't let them be there. And, and, and what's interesting, though, is it's across the board. It's yes. actually it's across the political spectrum. These protests are happening outside MPs' homes and offices. All the time. It's always the staff who are actually in the offices. It's not the yeah. MPs themselves most of the time. For example, Lindsay Hoyle, the Speaker, after his debacle yeah. uh, in Parliament, mm. had a load of protesters turn up, um, pro Palestinian protesters turn up outside his office in Chorley. He's not even there most of the week. And But it's, 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 it's people on, on low wages who are trying to do good things, who are yeah. being Intimidated day Andy, day why is it always the people who we keep being told we need to stand up for who are doing the harassing, whether or not it is, you know, hardline elements of uh, the Muslim community, whether or not it's the eco lot, whether or not it's the trans lot? It always seems to be those people who are doing the harassing. 85% of the public believe that freedom restricting harassment occurs. I, 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 I don't think we're often told to stand up for climate protesters or eco zealots. I, well, I our politicians are doing it. Net zero by 2030 well, think, to the cost think, of 116 yeah, billion zero, pounds. That's your, your part. Jealousy. I don't think uh, believing in net zero by 2030 or 35 is eco zealousy. But bankrupting that's, that's a nation, Mike. Oh, not really carry on, carry on. Nation. I think the, the stripping of the kind of industrial infrastructure of our country has really bankrupted the nation, which goes back to the, you know when they no, took away the mines. No, but the think tanks of the past two days have said this will this will really harm the nation. The hundred one before. think tank, Aurora, which isn't really a think tank; it's a policy pressure group. Yeah. But what you, you know, lots of think tanks and lots of what pressure groups say lots of things. But do we, but you also know being being part of Labour that every single policy they put out is wrongly costed. It happens all well, the time. Uh, no, I wouldn't say every right. single policy, no. Yeah, I would. I, I think, ultimately, <laughs> I, all this... Oh, Essentially, what we've got here is um, cry bullies, haven't we? People who portray themselves as victims, uh, mm. you know, cry about how uh, how victimised they are, but then actually bully people into mm. silence, and that's the problem we've got. Yeah, it's a massive problem, and people expect the authorities to do something about it. Tragically, they don't do something about it in all too many cases, and it's all very well and good for somebody like me to sit here and dish out a mono and saying, oh, it's time to fight back. But you know what? If it's going to cost you your house, your job, and, you, you know, you're an ordinary person on the street, that is a massive, massive thing, and sometimes it's easier to keep your mouth shut. I just hope, I hope that on mass people don't, and maybe something gets done about it and the tide turns. But still to come, as Denmark publishes detailed statistics showing violent crime convictions broken down by nationality, 
Why can't we access the same information here in Britain? What are they trying to hide? Nigel Farage tackles that, plus the Church of England's latest PR disaster. But up next, journalist Anna May Mangan goes head to head with author Rebecca Reed on whether parents should be banned from sending kids to school wearing nappies. Yes, really, it's happening. Patrick Christie's tonight early on GB News. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. And I'd like to talk about Kate Middleton. Mm. Because I'm really confused here. Everyone, where is she? What is she doing? Why did she Photoshop this? Where this, what that? Is Why can't her? we just leave her alone? What is going on here? What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on this? I think it's tough because naturally, you know, if I was looking at this and we didn't have all the context of everything that's gone on in the royal family previously, I would be saying um, leave her alone. But at the same time, I think that the royal family have made a huge mistake by setting a certain precedent when it mm. comes to Meghan. And I think that when you've kind of branded Meghan as the one that's demanding privacy, but then not really realising that she's got a particular role and a duty and mm. has to kind of be paraded in front of us no matter what, then you end up in a position now when Kate really needs the privacy and she can't get it because we're so used to being in their business and finding out everything about them, even after they've given birth, that mm. precedent. I get when that, women... but what if, what if it's a mental health issue? What mm. if it's something like that? Or, mm. or a long, ongoing physical uh, thing that she doesn't want to talk about? But you know what it is? It's because everyone sees the royal families like ambassadors, so they're thinking, well, she's at home, and some people controversially will be like, well, we need to see her. Mm. She's, like, the face of multiple charities. They're basically, unfortunately, with the royal family, if they're not mm. seen, people are like, well, what's the point of them? And I know that sounds harsh, but, you know, this is not some person that... It's just, she can't work from home. Well, she's been described as the golden goose. 100%. Yeah. She, I mean, yeah. you, they rely on her a lot, yeah. don't they? I mean, she's yeah. front page of the newspapers whenever she steps out. Yeah. It's been amazing, actually, seeing photos of her this morning, how much we all miss her. You know, we haven't mm. seen her since just after Christmas. Mm. Um, what do you think about her being the one to apologise? Having her take the rap for it, even if she mm. did do it, I think that was, was quite unfair, really, and they so should well. have had, you know, a, a bit a of a one. better strategy. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. It's Patrick Christie's tonight, only on GB News. Now, Nigel Farage joins me live very, very shortly. Are we being lied to about the number of migrants and asylum seekers who are committing violent and sexual offences? But first, should parents be banned from sending kids to school in nappies? It's time for our head-to-head. -head. Yes, a, a recent report found that one in four new primary school children are still not toilet-trained. And polling from the charity Kindred has revealed why. Only 50% of parents thought they are solely responsible for toilet training their child. One in five parents thought children do not need to be out of nappies before starting reception. And another one in four believed schools should be hiring additional staff specifically to help toilet train their kids. 
Back in November, on this show, Tory MP and leader of the New Conservatives, Miriam Cates, sounded the alarm. Massive deal for schools, just to start with. You know, I've spoken to head teachers who are having to move teaching assistants down from higher years in primary school into the lower years just to change nappies and clear up mess. This is a very, very basic problem. And if we can't get that right, then it shows there's something wrong. All right, what's your view? Is this lazy, disgusting parenting? Should kids be banned from turning up to school in nappies? Let me know your thoughts. Email me gbviews at gbnews.com. Tweet me at gbnews. And make sure you take part in our poll. I'll bring you the results very shortly. But doing battle on this now are a pair of journalists and authors. It's Anna May Mangan and Rebecca Reed. Both of you, thank you very much. Great to have you on the show. Uh, Anna, I'll start with you. Do you think that parents should be banned from presenting their children at school nappied up? A hundred percent they should. And, and if they do do that, they should be the person that they call if they have to have a nappy change when they're five or six or seven. I mean, what is going on that they can't sort out the nappy problem? Now, I'm not talking here about children who have special needs or medical yeah. needs. or now, Obviously, I'm excluding all of that. Yeah. But the children who turn up for prim at primary school and they have, they're in nappies, they can't put their coats on, they can't brush their teeth, there's all sorts of things. What are the parents doing? Mm. I mean, Rebecca, there's elements to this which I find really, really concerning, which is that teachers have to then have a witness whenever there's a nappy change because of, you know, rights and all the concerns that might surround that. And I'm amazed that parents are comfortable enough with essentially a total stranger changing their naked young child at school. Yeah, I find it remarkable. Well, yes, but the majority of the children will have been in nursery for up to two, three years previously, where the same thing will have been. Children who go to nursery are changed by their key worker, or if you're a childminder, the childminder changes them. So it's very unusual for children to arrive at school having not been changed by a paid childcare professional previously. Obviously, that person has to be fully DBS checked. Um, but no, it's not strange to have a stranger change your child. It's part of using childcare. And, and just to stick oh. with you, Rebecca, you, you think it's all right then that... Uh, kids are turning up in quite high numbers to their school with nappies on. So it's, I, it certainly wouldn't be my ideal. It's not. It would not be my goal. I would absolutely want to be trying to get potty training done as quickly as possible. But if you have a child who is difficult to potty train, which some children are, I would prefer that they started that they started um, school, particularly if they're a summer-born child who is starting and they're four and they're really very young in their class. I'd rather that than them turning up and being traumatised by being rushed and forced into it and perhaps having accidents at school. So I wouldn't aim for it. I don't think it's ideal, but I think every child is different and there are times where it happens. And we should be kind about it, not aggressive and cruel about it. Anna, would you refer the parents to social services? Uh, I would not social services, but they need a talking to. And there should be some rules. If you're bringing your child to primary school, they have to be potty trained. And I hear what Rebecca says about other professionals changing them throughout their young lives. But ultimately, it's the parents' job. And let's face it, it's free to potty train. What does it cost? It takes patience. It takes a bit of time. It takes some... In interest to do it and for the sake of the teachers who are by the way highly trained educators they're not nappy changers there's not enough budget in school for nappies and uh, other workers which like you say for safeguarding there has to be two so really they, this should not be happening and the, it's the parent the parents need to parent and take responsibility for this it's not about being unkind but even if you going in their nappy, that the other children will be unkind to them because they'll smell it, they'll see it, they'll know it, and it makes life harder for everybody. Even if you accept, even if you accept that it's a failure of parenting for your child to start school in nappies, and I think in some cases that's probably the case, in what world is the appropriate thing to do for a child who has parents who can't be bothered to potty train them to be sent home to spend more time what, what, with... Can I just say... My... I, wouldn't send them home. I wouldn't send them home. I wouldn't let them in in the first place. If they're not potty trained, they're so not ready if to you have a bad That's parent, the way that I see it. And also, if, this if is a range of other time, things and that go... are linked. So it's not just the potty training that's the problem normally. Right, that's, it's a one... Rebecca, 50%, no, Rebecca, Rebecca, 50 of parents apparently don't think it's solely their responsibility to, to potty train their own child. I mean, that is remarkable. 
Well, I think a lot of parents would say it's not solely their responsibility because they have friends who help, parents who help, grandparents who help. I would, all of my parenting is predominantly my responsibility, but my mum does a huge amount. My sister does a huge amount. So nothing I do is solely my responsibility. Um, but I think the important thing is here, in those occasions where you have a bad parent who just can't be bothered, if you don't let a child go to primary school because they're not toilet trained, they will not learn. They will just be at home with a parent who can't be bothered. That's worse. We do not punish children for the sins of their parents. That is a, t a failure of the state. I agree with that, but we do have to concentrate the parents' minds to get them to do what they need to do, right. and not allowing their children to be at school is going to speed up potty training no end. NHS say that they should be potty trained between two and three, so if they're getting to school at four and a half, that's a dereliction of duty, isn't it? Yeah, and Rebecca, look, well, it's, not the, it's not the responsibility of teachers. Is this not symptomatic of the kind of society that we live in, where everything else is somebody else's fault, and they think, oh, great, it's a free education system, dare I say it, maybe they're not all paying into society anyway as it is, and they lob them to school, and they think, oh, it's all right, someone else will wipe my kid's backside. I mean, there's no suggestion that this is a class issue. Um, Samantha Britt did a piece in the Daily Mail about this being mostly middle-class mums. So, this is, so the suggestion that people who are not putting their training, their children aren't paying into the you know, state, I don't think is accurate. I think it is a difficult thing to do. I think parenting is very complicated. And also, bear in mind, the children who are going into school at the moment are pandemic babies. That is a very weird generation of children. Anybody well, you know more time at home. will tell you well, that they are very they'd be more likely to be potty trained if they've been at home with their parents for a long it's time. Just not true. They're, honestly, like, and it's, it's genuinely not true. They are a very different, very odd group of babies who had a very hard entry to the world, and understandably, they have been impacted by that. Okay, the Anna, whole final class one. goes in 2.5 hours a day when teachers have to do these personal care tasks and, and tra uh, teacher assistance. So it's selfish. It's, it's impacting, it's not just the one child, they're impacting the 30 others in the class. And also that same study that you mentioned said that kids who aren't de developmentally up there, mm. uh, even to, as early as 20 months, have a worse outcome as adults educationally. So mm. it, it's not so just about a bit of poo in an appy, it's about their whole futures. But the, de the, de the point about development is important because we, s we were all saying, oh, but not disabled kids. We're not saying it's about disabled mm. kids. A lot of children who are starting school at four will not have had a formal diagnosis yet. So a lot of those children who are being diagnosed, who were saying started in nappies, may well actually have learning difficulties, particularly something like autism, which makes children more complicated. But it didn't used to be this bad. Did it? This is this is the thing. I, I get the lockdown side of it. That has screwed kids up, all right. And there's no there's there's absolutely no two ways around that. And I think we're going to be reaping the benefits, or sorry, lack of benefits, the problems of that, uh, for years to come, for a literally an entire generation, right? So yeah, I do get that. But but it, people were not presenting their children at school years and years and years ago that were all wear wearing nappies. But look, thank you very much, both of you. It was a cracking head-to-head. -head. Uh, look, who do you agree with? Uh, as nine in ten adults say that pupils should be toilet trained, should parents be banned from sending kids to school in nappies? Rita on X says, yes, teachers are there to help children to learn, not teach basic hygiene. No wonder no one wants to go into the profession. I agree with you completely. You know, when you go into teaching, you don't think you're going to end up wiping your kid's backside, do you? Shauna says, why would you begrudge the idea of teachers helping children? Yeah, help... Look, look, Shauna, helping them with maths, helping them with English, helping them with a smattering of French, maybe, not a smattering of something else. Chris says, if a kid is four to five years old and can't go to the toilet on their own, what the hell have the parents been doing? It isn't that hard to teach a kid to use the loo. Your verdict is now in. 95% of you agree that parents should be banned from sending kids to school in nappies. 5% of you say they shouldn't. Coming up, as the government vows to crack down on Chinese cyber attacks, what can be done to stop their repeated campaigns against our country? Why are we so soft? On China, Fleet Street Kingpin Kelby McKenzie joins me live in the studio, and I think he's got a few words, by the way, for our Foreign Secretary, one David Cameron. But next, should the British government follow the lead of their Danish counterparts? A fascinating story, this. So they've recently published figures showing the breakdown of violent crime convictions by the offender's nationality. By the way, can you guess which nationalities are at the top? Hmm? Anyway, Nigel Farage certainly thinks that we should be able to access that information here. He will tell us more right after this very, very short break. Stay tuned. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Good evening to you. The rest of this week 
Well, be prepared for further heavy downpours and temperatures staying around about or a little bit below average. Low pressure is well and truly in control of our weather and will be for the rest of this week. These weather fronts have been making for a pretty soggy day for much of the UK. The rain across Scotland, falling of snow over the hills, that continues in the east through the night. Elsewhere, it does turn a little bit drier, uh, staying fairly cloudy and um, staying fairly chilly. Temperatures down into single figures, not far freezing in northern Scotland and small wintry showers coming into the northern and the western isles as we go into Tuesday. Still a bit more snow over the Grampians, although that should ease. Further showers, though, to come in the east coast of Scotland. Central and southern Scotland looking a little bit drier compared to today. It'll be a wetter day, though, for the southeast as that rain moves in through Tuesday and that spreads into the Midlands and rain again for Northern Ireland. But something a bit brighter in the southwest and south Wales and for eastern England, too, some glimmers of sunshine. But it is going to feel pretty chilly, particularly across Scotland, where the Rain and hill snow continues into Wednesday and then elsewhere it's bands of showers moving in. Be prepared for some heavy downpours on Wednesday. There will be some brighter spells between the heavy showers, a bit of sunshine. We'll see temperatures up to double digits, but generally feeling cooler in the breeze and plenty more of those heavy showers to come in the run up to Easter. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. men's mental health, yeah. men are starting to talk a lot more. Yeah. You've been through a lot of stuff that uh, people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, um, the last few years for me have been very, very difficult. Um, people, don't, people see me on tour, performing, making music, um, but um, myself and my wife, um, you know, we went through um, two miscarriages, oh, um, wow. you know, and, you know, for us, that was a very devastating mm, of time and very difficult to, to, to know how to kind of process those emotions. Mm. And I guess as a man, I, I did the thing of bottling up my emotions and where I feel comfortable to, to be able to express myself is in the studio. Whereas, you know, she had obviously a different reaction to, you know, what happened to us because not only was it happening to her mentally, psychologically, but it was happening to her physically as well. And I think what something that she really would wanted to see from me was that sensitivity and that emotion. And I thought that as a man being strong was trying to bottle up my emotions and just show her that, no, mm. you know, that I'm, I'm being strong for her. Mm. But actually being strong was, is talking about it. Mm. And what's happened ever since I've started to talk about it is I've spoken to more men that have experienced baby loss. My wife forced out of me, you know, how do you feel? And I end up as a mess on the floor. I was exasperating, crying, oh. almost inconsolable. She was just holding me in her arms um, as we cried together, and we cried together. Um, and I didn't realise I needed that release so badly. Like I said, I've been able to speak to other men, and 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 we've been able to cry together. And they've they shared their own experiences, which they did similar to me. But actually. You know, as men, I feel like that conversation and that sensitivity and being able to be mm. emotional together. Welcome back. It's Patrick Christie tonight. We're on GB News. Lows coming your way. Fleet Street legend Kelvin McKenzie on the alleged Chinese cyber attack against millions of British voters very soon. But first, it's time now for Brexit broker Nigel Farage. Now, Tory backbencher Neil O'Brien has called on the government to publish more detailed immigration records as he attacked what he called the Great Immigration Data Disaster. This comes after Denmark published figures showing conviction rates for violent crime by nationality, with the highest ranking nationality being the Kuwaitis. Now, I'm just going to talk you through a couple of the others here. Tunisia, Lebanon, Somalia, Jordan, Uganda, Morocco, Iraq, Algeria, Ethiopia, Egypt, Iran, Afghanistan, Kenya, Turkey, Syria, Ghana, Pakistan. Yeah, there is, it appears, a correlation, isn't there? The Kuwaitis were convicted for nine times more violent crime than native Danes between 2010 and 2021. But here in Britain, we have no such luck. The Ministry of Justice does publish the nationality of current prisoners, but if you ask for any further analysis of that, such as what type of crime they're committed or whether they are asylum seekers, they will not provide it. We sent a freedom of information request weeks ago, but as of tonight, we are yet to hear back. Nigel joins me now. Nigel, why aren't we able to access the same information as Denmark? 
So I got these figures on Friday, uh, and I put them out on Twitter, or X as it now is. Do you know what's interesting, Patrick? I've had no media pickup at all. None. Zero. Mm. Nobody even wants to debate the truth. And the truth is this. I'm not suggesting for one moment that everybody that comes here from Iraq or Syria or Kuwait or wherever it may be, and the parallels of Denmark, of course, are there. I'm not suggesting they're all bad people. What I'm saying is, when you have a lax border policy, when you allow illegals to come in and stay, the criminal gangs see richer pickings in our countries than where they come from, in some cases, where they might get their hands cut off. I mean, literally, their hands cut off. And so we've opened the doors in Western Europe to mass criminality. Now, Denmark are brave enough to publish the figures. Sweden prohibit by law the media even discussing the background or ethnicity of perpetrators of horrible, violent or sexual crimes. And in this country, everyone stays stum. Mm. Mm. You can't get the figures. You don't know the truth. But you know, and I know, in London that the bad guys from Romania, the bad guys from the Middle East, have flocked to our country in numbers. You cannot now walk down the street in Chelsea as a woman wearing expensive jewellery. No one does it anymore. These figures are absolutely shocking. Now, I know that our critics will say we're being racist. We're not. We're just... The reason I put this out, mm. we're just representing the facts, it is appalling. Well, we'd know for sure, wouldn't we? This is the thing. We, we would know for sure. If they published the data and they showed yeah. us all and they told us all what was really going on, the one thing that I'm really focused on and we are working out here to do our best to get, if they'll give it to us, is sexual convictions and sexual crimes based on nationality, immigration status and asylum status. Because there, there is... We, we asked again today, by the way, for that. We are, we are yet to get a reply. Uh, if, why, why do you think they're covering that up from us at the moment, or at least withholding it? Because the truth is, Patrick, that many of these young men who come from those countries come from a culture where women aren't even second-class citizens. All right? Where, you know, sexual exploitation, abuse um, of, of, of all kinds is frankly mainstream. And they're coming into a country where, you know, and we've been more progressive than most actually over the years, you know, um, we find this unacceptable. They refuse to assimilate. They refuse to uh, integrate. They bring their cultures with them, but it can't be discussed. Hmm. Can't be discussed. It's too awful. It's too difficult. And of course it is Patrick racist, remember. And anyone that discusses it, is far right and therefore evil and bad and wrong. And so we're prepared to allow yeah, it, British, it, British female citizens mm. to suffer at the hands of these bad people that come from these countries. Not all bad people from these countries. I re-emphasise that point. And we'd rather shut up mm. and let the native population suffer than tell the truth. It has to be a part. It has to be a part of the immigration debate. We have 750,000, 650,000, whatever we have got, plus people coming across the channel, and it has to be a part of public discourse and parliamentary discourse to be able to have the discussion about what kind of crimes some, some of these people may be committing, and that yeah, can well, therefore I mean, shape policy. You've got no chance of parliamentary debate on this. No chance. Mm. You know, Sir Edward Lee might get up and say something. Virtually nobody else in the whole House of Commons dares to get up if we had the, if these figures were published in this country, then frankly the Conservatives' poll ratings would tank, even from their current low levels, because they've allowed this to happen under 14 years of their tenure. Yes, I know Tony Blair started it, but it's got so much worse in the last 14 years. Yeah, those figures there, um, just before we move on, Nigel, you know, Kuwait, Tunisia, Lebanon, Somalia, Jordan, Uganda, Morocco, Iraq, Algeria, Yugoslavia, Ethiopia, <laughs> Serbia, Egypt, Iran, Afghanistan, Kenya. You've got to go all, all the way down, all the way down before you get to Denmark, really. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, certainly all the way down before you get to Denmark. And that, those are the figures, of course, of, of the crimes there in Denmark, which I find absolutely astonishing. But anyway, look, we've approached the Ministry of Justice for comment, but they are yet to respond. We will, of course continue to try to get some answers out of them. But now, an archdeacon for the Church of England has caused uproar after calling for anti-whiteness and smashing the patriarchy. Writing on X, formerly known as Twitter, Miranda 
Threlfall Holmes, lovely, isn't it? Said, I want, I went to a conference on whiteness last autumn. It was very good, very interesting. It made me realise whiteness is to race as patriarchy is to gender. So, yes, let's have anti-whiteness. Let's smash the patriarchy. That's not anti-white or anti-men, it's anti-oppression. This completes a, an unholy trinity of recent blunders for the church after they decided that their £100 million fund to tackle the legacy of slavery should be upped to a billion quid, while the Diocese of Birmingham recently advertised for a deconstructing whiteness officer to help the church address white fragility. Uh, this forced the Archbishop of Canterbury to condemn the job advert, even he said it was like something out of a BBC sitcom W1A. <laughs> I mean, I wonder if he put that in his Ramadan message, Nigel. But does the Church of England need a complete overhaul? I won't go to my local church. I won't go. Mm. I am christened and confirmed in the Church of England. All my family on both sides had been Church of England. I used to believe in it. I used to attend. Not every Sunday, but regularly during the year. I will not go. It is hopeless. They've given up. They've surrendered. And her name sums it up. You know, I don't know her personally, but I'll have a bet. She's upper middle class, you know, completely detached from reality. And on slavery, can I remind everybody that today is the 217th anniversary of the passing of the Abolition of Slavery Act, as it became mm -hmm. in Parliament, pushed by a man called William Wilberforce, which then led us through the Royal Naval Squadron to attempt to drive slavery out right across the Atlantic, stopping other countries from doing so. When it comes to this issue, you think to listen to some of our lefties that we are the only country that ever practiced it, no far from it. Slavery persists to this right. day. We as a nation have done more to stop slavery than any other nation in the history of our Earth. Now, let's be quite quick with this one, Nigel. So, American sports brand Nike put English noses out of joint last week. They unveiled what they called a playful update to the St George's flag on England's new football shirts. Now, Liverpool star Harvey Elliott seemed to reject the new flag. He might have just been wearing his collar up, of course, but he turned his collar up anyway during the England and 21s match. Not one of the senior players, not one, has decided to protest this design when England faced Brazil and got beaten, by the way, at Wembley this weekend. Look, Nigel, should England's senior football stars be making a bit of a stand over this? Well, they're footballers, not politicians, and they're conscious of that. They know that. Mm. They're also earning a fortune. Uh, but frankly, frankly, I think given that the crowd themselves made their own cross to St George in the crowd, which is a very beautiful image, I think our top footballers on this one should have intervened. They didn't. It's a bit gutless. Mm. Nigel, look, thank you very much, as always. That was Nigel Farage. Until next time. Now, coming up, a GB News exclusive for you, and it reveals a new way that our broken asylum system could cost you, the taxpayer, millions of pounds. I know, as if it wasn't already costing you enough, I'll reveal all just after 10pm, but next. With the government today blaming China for a pair of terrifying cyber attacks that access the information of up to 40 million British voters, so with respect, it's probably you, is it time to finally stand up to the super state? Kelvin McKenzie is live, he's in the studio next, and as we mark three years since the Batley school teacher went into hiding, have we officially lost to extremists. It's Patrick Christie's tonight. We are on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Now, reports suggest that Boris Johnson could make a general election comeback for the Tories, with the former Prime Minister expected to campaign for the Conservatives in red wall seats, although not stand in one himself. Yes, he wants to take the fight to Keir Starmer. So, GB News East Midlands reporter Will Hollis has been in Bassett Law asking locals whether they want to see Boris make a comeback. I actually used to like Boris Johnson, but he let me down with Covid, and so, therefore, I, w I won't be voting Conservative anymore. I did do, but not anymore. Not for me and anybody else here, because from, all, from, from day one, he's been a liar all along. Don't vote for him. Stick with Labour. I like Boris Johnson, to be honest with you, and I think it could do a boost for Conservatives. I've always been a Labour voter, to be saying like, but uh, no, I went to Conservative. Personally, not for me, no, no. He's, done, he's not done anything to make any arrangements to make this time better. When he was in charge of the Conservative Party, all he thought about was the upper class, not the working class, because he was telling everybody to stay at home during COVID, and what did he do? 
he had an house party. Well, there you go, the views of the people of Bassett Law. Not well, so he, keen He was overall. telling people to stay at home. He did, there's no suggestion he didn't stay at home. Well, no, but I guess there's uh, mixed reviews on whether Boris Johnson's to make a comeback. I guess the idea is that he'll appeal to Red Wall voters far more than Rishi Sunak. So if they can use him up there, then uh, maybe he'll help them out. And well, I think they want to get David Cameron to uh, campaign in the, uh, in the Blue Wall, in the Shires, because he goes down well there. Allies of Boris Johnson have been pouring cold water on this report, of course. Nadine Dorries tweeting earlier today that uh, Rishi and Boris actually haven't spoken in the last year. Mm. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live, here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live, here on GB News, Britain's election channel. It's Patrick Christie tonight on GB News. Now I am joined by the former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie. Quite a bit to get through tonight, but after it was revealed that Chinese hackers accessed 40 million British voters' personal details, so it is probably you, former Tory leader Ian Duncan Smith called a press conference demanding that China be labelled a threat. Then in Parliament, Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden confirmed that the Communist state was behind a malicious cyber attack. United Kingdom judges that these actions demonstrate a clear and persistent pattern of behaviour that signal, signals hostile intent from China. Well, that's all right, but he basically decided to do absolutely naff all about it, didn't he? Calvin China has branded the accusations as fabricated in malicious slanders. Look, isn't this all David Cameron's fault? Well, he, he didn't help it, neither did Osborne. They were going to have a good relationship with uh, China, which probably meant bending over in some kind of eaten way, I don't know. But anyway, it's completely shocking, and uh, it hasn't worked out well. But that guy, Oliver Dowden, what a waste of space he is. And actually, due to the fact that Labour appear to be winning by about 28,000% now, he will be here, he'll be pushing a broom outside some corporate comms unit probably yeah. towards the end of this year. And um, this is the problem. The, the problem is we, we talk tough, but we don't do tough. How can we do tough against 20% of humanity who don't care, don't mm. tell us anything, and actually our manufacturers all want to be there anyway? It, uh, honestly, we'd be probably better off to say nothing. And I, I really admire Duncan Smith because at least he's been pushing this now for way north of a decade. Yeah. He knew Huawei was, was a danger and it took years before the rest of the government well, caught up with it. We do not possess a real will. No. If we had a real will, we'd say, we will never trade with you again. Now, China may not give us stuff, but at least, we'd be, at least we would be strong. We've done nothing to them about Hong Kong, OK? We've done nothing about the old coronavirus stuff. Which, well, the good uh, thing about Hong uh, Kong is that a load of Hong Kongers have come here. That's true. And that is the best import we would have ever had. They will generate money, and not only that, their mates, right, will give them money, which they're not allowed to ship out of China, to come over here. Mm -hmm. And they will invest in businesses, invest in property, yeah. and that is the greatest import we would have had. Yeah, we are. And, I mean, it's, there's two Chinese nationals uh, that have been sanctioned and one relatively minor Chinese company for the, for the yeah, small price of 40 million of us having our details hacked and honestly, by Beijing. So, honestly, cheers, Oliver Dowler. Thank you very much, mate. Ma he, he, he makes himself look an idiot, an absolute idiot. Makes the government look an idiot. He just as well says nothing. All right. Now, look, elsewhere, a, a shocking new government report shows that 76% of Brits are too scared to share their personal views. Published today, the Khan Review, authorised by Dame Sara Khan, uses Batley Grammar as a case study, where in 2021 a teacher was hounded out by local Muslim protesters showing school kids an image of the Prophet Muhammad, and we've seen plenty of communities flare up since. This is essentially a report that says we are now at the mercy of extremists. Calvin, was Britain surrendered? I, 
Batley is beyond, beyond shocking. And what is fantastic about this report is that that lady is a Muslim and she was born and raised in Bradford and she is massively upset about it. The council at Kirklees did nothing. Why? 41% of the area surrounding mm -hmm. Batley is Muslim, right? The police did nothing. They said they didn't know that there was a big problem. Really? What do you think these people were doing shouting outside the school? The school said nothing, mm -hmm. right? And in the end, so the whole thing... And this guy said he felt this is the teacher, right? A father of four, had to change his name, fled his job. He'd been doing the same thing, showing the same cartoon now for two years. Nothing had gone wrong before, right? Nobody, nobody, a few media commentators and actually a guy I got to know up in Batley, he did something about it. He raised money for that guy. Mm -hmm. He raised, you know, they raised around about £100,000. Without that, that guy and his family would have starved to death. We worry about the rest of the world starving to death. It was an absolute disgrace. And the main point that that very, very, very good report, and I urge all your viewers to read it, actually was the point that they were introducing by back door those protesters, a blasphemy law, mm. and nobody, nobody said anything about it. And who said anything about it? Ledbetter didn't say anything about it. The woman who went on to be mayor of West Yorkshire said nothing about it. But did the Prime Minister say anything about it? Did the leader of the opposition say anything about it? Did a Lib Dem? Nobody gave a damn about that guy. They didn't give a damn about it. Three years later, a fantastic report comes out. Mm. But it's three years later. How is that chap... Is that chap ever going to be able to work again? Right? Mm. What's going to happen to him? Yeah, exactly. Look, we reached out to the uh, the MP of the area, Labetta, who did say to us, look, she did comment on it uh, at the time yep. and, and and all of this. So, you know, that... that credit she, work, she actually... Credit she's actually changed that. her tune. She says, I accept all this. Why didn't she say that at the time? Well, she... Yeah, OK, fine. What she says is she was saying this at the, at the time and, and uh, you know, that we'll have to take that at face value, whether she was doing it more privately. Well, then no, nobody, know, but... nobody locally has ever said that to me and I've had tens of... Okay. Hundreds right. of thousands of reactions. All right, fine, but it's not just about Batley Grammar as well. We've got councillors, you know, loads of them saying that they don't want to do it anymore because of threats, threats to gang rape their two year old daughter and right. trafficker and all right. of this stuff, you know. And, and how common is this stuff now? And we just have to live with it, you know. It's not even just that, is it? It's the old Christmas market stuff. Walk, walk around the Christmas market, happy Christmas, watch out for bombs. It's just yeah. mad. No, it, it's a very. But Batley is a stain on, first of all, on West Yorkshire. And actually, a stand. Um, where about? What did you hear? Did you hear anything from the National Education Union? No. The employers. There wasn't one arrest made in Batley, even when they turned up at the teacher's house. There wasn't one arrest made. No. It, I, I, I honestly, I, it, it makes me wonder. And, and there will be lots of these Batleys mm -hmm. going on in a smaller way. Not as serious now, because now we've got this template, a fantastic report, by the way, by a Muslim, uh, a Muslim academic. I, I can't tell you how, how much joy I got by reading it. OK, all right. Well, look, Kelvin, thank you very, very much. As ever, Kelvin McKenzie there, the former editor of The Sun. In response to Dame Sarah Khan's review, Kim Ledbetter MP said, as I said at the time, there can be absolutely no excuse for the intimidation and threats against him. Uh, this is the teacher. Whilst I am a strong advocate of free speech and the right to peaceful protest, Protest. I'm also fully supportive of restricting protests outside schools, as recommended by the report. Yes, OK, but restricting protests outside schools quite possibly does very little to actually resolve the real core issue, which is some of the people involved in those protests. But coming up, as Russia torments and abuse four Moscow terror suspects with one force-fed his own ear by Putin's agents, is the torture of terrorists ever justified. But next, I bring you an absolutely staggering GB News exclusive. Now, this is important, OK? It's on a Channel Migrants lawsuit that could have devastating consequences on our border security and cost you, the taxpayer, millions of pounds. There could well be a very worrying precedent that is being set here. I reveal the absolutely astonishing cost that A, you're already paying for, and B, frankly, you are potentially about to be paying for. If you've got a wallet at home, you might as well empty it now and send it to your nearest immigration lawyer. You can get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.com. This is Patrick Christie's tonight. We are only on GB News, and now it's time for your weather with the wonderful Alex Deacon. Warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. 
This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Good evening to you. The rest of this week, well, be prepared for further heavy downpours and temperatures staying around about or a little bit below average. Low pressure is well and truly in control of our weather and will be for the rest of this week. These weather fronts have been making for a pretty soggy day for much of the UK. The rain across Scotland, falling of snow over the hills, that continues in the east through the night. Elsewhere, it does turn a little bit drier, uh, staying fairly cloudy and um, staying fairly chilly. Temperatures down into single figures, not far freezing in northern Scotland and small wintry showers coming into the northern and the western isles as we go into Tuesday. Still a bit more snow over the Grampians, although that should ease. Further showers, though, to come on the east coast of Scotland. Central and southern Scotland looking a little bit drier compared to today. It'll be a wetter day, though, for the southeast as that rain moves in through Tuesday and that spreads into the Midlands and rain again for Northern Ireland. But something a bit brighter in the southwest and south Wales and for eastern England, too, some glimmers of sunshine. But it is going to feel pretty chilly, particularly across Scotland where the rain and hill snow continues into Wednesday and then elsewhere it's bands of showers moving in. Be prepared for some heavy downpours on Wednesday. There will be some brighter spells between the heavy showers, a bit of sunshine. We'll see temperatures up to double digits but generally feeling cooler in the breeze and plenty more of those heavy showers to come in the run up to Easter. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was, and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter our massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats, and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 10 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie's tonight. A GB News exclusive. Asylum lawyers have got a new way to cost you millions of pounds. Plus, is it okay to torture terrorists like the Russians and in terms of incidents and hate crime incidents, it's important that they are recorded because what it does is it gives police an idea of where there might be space and hatred. They want to criminalise what you say in your own home. Also... More opportunities for Noah Lynn Van Leuven. Outrage over men in women's darts. I've got all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages and my panel are bang up for it. It's columnist Carol Malone, trade unionist Andy McDonald and Express political editor Sam Lister. And find out what the heck is going on here. Get ready, Britain. Here we go.
Empty your wallets for the asylum seekers. Next. But first, the news at one minute past ten and our top story from the GB newsroom tonight is that the Deputy Prime Minister has accused China of being responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting the Electoral Commission. Databases containing the names and addresses of 40 million registered voters were visible to Chinese hackers in 2021 and 2022. But the government says it didn't affect the outcome of local elections at the time. Oliver Dowden also said that that national cyber security support would help political parties make sure they're protected from foreign influence in the run-up to the general election. We want now to be as open as possible with the House and with the British public, because part of our defence is calling out this behaviour. This is the latest in a clear pattern of hostile activity originating in China including the targeting of democratic institutions and parliamentarians in the United Kingdom and beyond. Oliver Dowden. Now, in other news today, a review has found prosecutors were correct to accept Nottingham triple killer Valdo Canacani's manslaughter plea by diminished responsibility rather than pursue a murder case. Grace O'Malley-Kumar and Bern Barnaby Webber, along with school caretaker Ian Coates, were killed by Kalakani in June last year when he was suffering from schizophrenia. He was sentenced to a hospital order instead of being sent to prison for murder. His Majesty's Crown Prosecution Inspectorate said the correct decision was made by the CPS. The protest groups Save British Farming and Fairness for Farmers of Kent have driven their tractors into central London tonight to protest about substandard imports and the dishonest labelling of food. They're also protesting against low-cost agricultural imports, saying it all amounts to a threat to food security. It comes after European farmers ramped up their demonstrations across the continent, protesting against EU and national measures. The Home Office is launching social media adverts to deter Vietnamese migrants from trying to travel to the UK illegally in small boats. The government says an increasing number of illegal migrants from Vietnam are attempting to come to the UK via the English Channel. New government-sponsored ads building on similar examples already used in Albania are being designed, setting out the risks of being exploited by smuggling gangs or being deported. And lastly, the CEO of Boeing is to step down by the end of the year in a major management shake-up at the aircraft manufacturer following a raft of safety concerns. Dave Calhoun and other senior executives will step down after a series of scandals to hit Boeing, including the apparent suicide of a whistleblower who had reportedly raised concerns about the company's production issues. The company's been under particular pressure to do something following the sudden blowout of an aircraft fuselage at 16,000 feet on an Alaska Airlines Boeing 737 MAX in January. Those are the latest top stories. For the latest news, sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Strap yourselves in. Today, it's emerged that the legal aid bill for channel migrants is £71 million. That's over the last five years. That's a £38,000 a day bill. A record more than 500 migrants crossed in a single day on Wednesday. Channel crossings are up 10% on this time last year. The total is more than 4,000. The Home Office expects to spend £1.2 billion on housing asylum seekers in large accommodation sites. That's around £46 million more than using hotels. Some ex-RAF sites were set to cost £5 million each. Instead, it's cost £49 million for Wethersfield and £27 million for Scampton. Rwanda could cost £1.8 million per asylum seeker, and that's before we've paid the wages for all the lords and MPs who are dead set on blocking it. A former Home Office official told me that we will be paying hundreds of millions of pounds in benefits and social housing for channel migrants who will never, ever get a job here for the rest of their lives. James Cleverley's got a cunning plan. Let's release a video in English that we can show to illegal immigrants in Calais telling them how dangerous it is to get on a small boat. 
Everyone has this sense of idea that it's just as simple, they get in a boat and they come over. It's not as simple as that. Nine times out of 10, these boats, are, these dinghies are overloaded. Uh, they're really poorly constructed. And so we just towed them here anyway. That'll learn them, Mr. Cleverly, but here is your GB News exclusive. You ready? There is another way that the lawyers and the Human Rights Brigade are probably going to take the British taxpayer to the cleaners. And it's because of something happening right now in France. The family of an illegal migrant who died with 26 others when crossing the English Channel are currently suing the French government. They claim the French authorities did not do enough to stop their deaths. Three children and a pregnant mum were sadly included in the death toll, which happened in November 2021. Now, the French Coast Guard have been accused of criminal negligence over the incident, which claims that they ignored repeated and increasingly desperate pleas for help from the migrants. New claims, which emerged last week, include the French military boat patrolling the waters was not monitoring Channel 16, which is the international distress frequency on which the British Rescue Centre had issued Mayday calls to help the boat. Its crew also allegedly ignored three distress signals, 15 warnings are said to have been ignored, and seven military personnel have now been charged. So the claim is believed to run into the hundreds of thousands of euros. Now, obviously, if you times that by 26, then you're into the millions, aren't you? There are also fears that victims of other tragedies now may sue the British government as a result of this. And it's easy to see how this won't just be for deaths. It could be for injuries, or harm suffered, like hypothermia, or mental trauma. The same kind of mental trauma that human rights lawyers tell their clients to emphasise when they're trying to stay in Britain. Tory MP Nigel Mills said that he fears that Britain could face legal action over the more than 200 migrants who have died trying to make the journey. Mr Mills, MP for Amber Valley in Derbyshire, said, I fear they'll come for Britain next. It's a tragedy. But there needs to be personal responsibility. If French law enforcement were to blame, they should face the full force of their laws. But I fear Britain will be sued next. It's wrong. They have my sympathy, but they are taking the risk, and it's against the law. A burglar who falls over and breaks his leg when burgling a house cannot sue the homeowner for damages, and rightly so. It's not as straightforward as that here, but the principle remains the same. Well said that man. The deaths are a tragedy, but look at everything I've outlined that you are already paying for there. And there's loads more on top of that. It is not the responsibility of the British taxpayer to cough up millions more pounds to pay compensation for the family of somebody who willingly paid to leave a safe country, to get in a small boat and be pushed across the busiest shipping lane in the world. The same lawyers and human rights groups who were licking their lips at fake Church of England baptisms will be practically drooling over this. Get ready to empty your wallets, Britain. Let's get the thoughts of my panel. It is Daily Express columnist Carol Malone. I have got trade unionist Andy McDonald and political editor at The Express, Sam Lister. Carol, do you fear that we're going to be on the hook for millions more oh, pounds? Oh, yes. Yeah. As soon as I, I, I read the story today, I thought, absolutely that. You know, as you just said there, every death is a tragedy. Mm. But let's not forget the vast majority of people crossing the Channel are doing it illegally, having paid traffickers many thousands of pounds. Um, they're crossing from a safe country to come here. But, you know, this government has repeatedly said that it's dangerous, people are going to die, so they have to stop it. And yet all that has been ignored and suddenly it is our, it's going to be our fault that they're coming here. It is outrageous. It is going to be... A, it's the next source of income for these lawyers. This is going to go on forever. The government surely now has to see what lies ahead. I mean, the, the figures you just read out there are astonishing, the, the money that we're paying out already, even stuff that I didn't know. Mm. Uh, not that I'm the fond of all knowledge, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, I do a lot of research on this stuff and I didn't mm. know some of those figures. And I, and I just... I, this is the next problem waiting, that every asylum... Every lawyer now is going to say to asylum seekers, sue for this, for mental yeah. trauma, for whatever, for, you know, for dehydration, you got cold a bit, you're not well. This is going to happen all the time. Look, we're, we're going to be on the hook here. You can see it happening now. Lawyers are on the phone as we speak. Not really. I think if 
you know, our really. if our Coast Guard had been as criminally negligent as it's been alleged the French Coast Guard have been here, then yeah, they should get a payout. You know, the fact that they, if they, if this is true, they had ignored 15 calls for for help. You know, the Channel 16, the international distress frequency, not for a call from the migrants, but a call from the, the British Rescue Centre. These aren't people in a dinghy that they've allegedly ignored here as well. Mm. You know, this is seriously, seriously negligent. So I think if the British did that, then yeah, they should be, they should, they should be sued to the high heavens for that. Do, do, do you think, can you not foresee a future whereby people push themselves off into the channel, across the busiest shipping lane, they get out into British waters, etc. something goes wrong, we're a bit too busy to be able to deal with it, people sadly die or are injured or whatever, and before you know it, the lawyers are on the phone and they're saying you should have done more. And members of our Coast Guard who, dare I say, I mean, shock horror, by the way, shock horror, might have been dealing to a, a British sailor who's capsized or something like that, they end up having to answer questions in court for criminal negligence? Oh, uh, maybe, but, you know, that's, that really not, you? that's not what this story is about at all. This is about, you know, 30, uh, 26 people died in this, and it it's been alleged that there was serious criminal negligence. It's not about people being a bit dehydrated or a bit tired because of a journey that they took across the channel. This is about people dying because if, someone else didn't someone do their job. If someone broke into your house and broke this their is, leg. That's not even remotely similar. It is. It's not even remotely similar. It, if, it it was, if it was my it's job to protect my house and make sure that anyone and who was injured there... And if you protected your house by hurting someone, you would be the one in court, not the person that... It's not even remotely similar. It's okay. not even remotely well, similar. Well, look, can you, can you foresee the British taxpayer here? We're already being asked to fork out an unbelievable amount of money. Uh, you know, hundreds hundreds of millions of pounds, billions of pounds when it comes to uh, you add up the uh, legal aid fees, you add up the cost of Rwanda, you add up the cost of the migrant hotels, all of that stuff. I'm just worried that this is going to be the next rung on the old legal ladder here. It's, it's an industry. I mean, let's be right. There are already many, many lawyers who are making a lot of money out of um, asylum cases, about appealing etc uh, etc et this is an industry we have to be clear on that and I think ultimately it, it is a tragedy when people die crossing the channel but the bottom line is they shouldn't be crossing shouldn't the channel cross, they're told not they should not be crossing the channel you know, they're, they're, and, that, and that's that that is the top and bottom of it you cannot um, penalize a state you cannot try and pursue a state for compensation for an activity that is you know, illegal. It's, it's interesting. There's a, uh, this bloke really angered me today. President of the Human Rights, a guy called Patrick Baldwin. He's talking about the murderous policies of non-assistance at sea. Hello, the French Navy escorts them to our border, and then our border patrol goes out and puts them on the boat and brings them over here. There's no murderous policies at sea. We're saving the RNLI and the border control have become a taxi service for these migrants. It's and then they're taken. Well, yeah, then they're taken to hotels that are costing us eight million a day. Uh, that's, that's the, besides the point on this story, I think the most important I, thing is that they weren't, they allegedly weren't monitoring Channel well, 16. That's, I, that's I hear huge. what you're saying, and I sort of half agree with you. I'm, that's I'm, that's I'm, really bad. I, but I, and, so Andy, it, should it, they be in the channel in the no, first place? Be. No, they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. Illegally but just there. because they shouldn't be there doesn't mean that these people can be criminally, but, but we, criminally the, negligent. The emergency services... You can't just ignore the British Rescue Centre. How, how do we know that the British Rescue Centre, if it wasn't these migrants, if they were talking about something, people who should have been there that were in trouble? How, do we, how, do, we know that, how do we know that they weren't busy with other... Call out. Oh, I guess we've got to wait until this court case goes through. You know, this is all alleged. To see what <laughs> what's been said in the court case, and then we'll be able to properly debate the facts. When you've when got hundreds solidified. and hundreds of people breaching our borders every day, sure. yeah. that's enormous pressure on mm. public services, both yes. in France and in Britain. Yeah. yeah, but that doesn't give you. It's not an excuse yeah, to be criminally you're, you're negligent. Again, as if it, this it, allegation this, has been proved already. It has not been. It's proved. a, it's a very a, serious a, allegation. Seven a, people have been charged. However, but as Sam said, you know, the border control and the French border control do not exist to save people. We are, we are one. My fear, one successful lawsuit in this, from yes. far from us yes. doing anything to deter them, actually having a ready supply of boats lined up yeah. right on our British waters yeah. Yeah. to take them in, yeah. so that we make sure we don't paying out any kind of compensation claims. That would be my worst case scenario in all of this. But thank you very much. Coming up, another GB News exclusive on Keir Starmer's energy plans. You won't believe how much it's going to cost. So will Labour's energy strategy actually bankrupt Britain? And next. As Russia released shocking images of the four main Moscow terror suspects, with one having had his ear severed, another reportedly losing an eye during their interrogations by Russian authorities, is the torture of terror suspects ever acceptable? Coercive interrogation expert Brian Leslie and former British intelligence officer Philip Ingram offer their unrivaled analysis. That's next. Stay tuned.
GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6 a.m. New rules are going to give staff at NHS England paid leave if they suffer a miscarriage. Yeah, any of the NHS England staff who miscarry in the first 24 weeks of pregnancy will be able to take 10 days paid leave. Their partners can take five. Well, we're lucky enough right now to be able to speak exclusively to the founder of George's Law and national baby loss campaigner, Keely Lengthorn. A very good morning to you, Keely. First of all, um, it's called George's Law because it is a, a major step forward, and that's one of your son's names, isn't it? Yes, it is, Anne, yes. Um, I lost my son, unfortunately, George, um, two years ago. Um, he was still born at, at 23 weeks. Um, I was flabbergasted after having George to know that I was required by law to return straight back to work the next day. So under current legislation in the UK, if you give birth to a baby under 24 weeks, the law says you should be going back to work the next day. So, for instance, I left George at the mortuary on a Thursday evening, had a midwife coming to stop my milk on a Friday, but the law says I should be in work the next day. It's such an archaic way of, of working now, and I don't know why we are not following the New Zealand model. And changing law and allowing employees three days paid leave. So under legislation in New Zealand, all employees get three days paid leave in the event of a miscarriage under 24 weeks. And it, it is it is so um, brilliant to see the NHS sort of taking a stance. They're the UK's biggest employer, 1.7 million employees. And they're, let's face it, they're on their knees in terms of financial hardship. But if, if, the, if the NHS can do this, I don't know why others can't. Yeah, and um, you make the interesting point as well that uh, although it is now there for NHS workers, they may have to face sending home bereaved parents who haven't got that right. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. All right, welcome back to Pantry Christie tonight on GB News. I will bring you the first of tomorrow's front pages very, very soon. Now, there were absolutely horrific scenes on Friday night as four gun-wielding terrorists stormed the Crocus City Concerts Hall and massacred at least 137 people. ISIS have since claimed responsibility for the attack, despite the Russian government's uncertainty over the claim. The Russian security services managed to capture the four suspects within hours, and it looks like they were subjected to some pretty gruesome treatment. Images were released of one of the suspects being electrocuted through his genitals, with graphic footage of another having his ear cut off and fed to him. That spread over the weekend. A third suspect appears to have lost an eye during his capture and interrogation by the Russian forces. Well, I'm delighted to welcome to the show Brian Leslie, who is a coercive interrogation expert, and Philip Ingram, a former senior British military intelligence officer. Both of you, thank you very much. Um, I will start with you, Brian, if that's OK. Sure. Is it ever OK to torture terror suspects in the way it looks like the Russians have? No. No, because it's unreliable. First of all, depending on how they actually discovered and what evidence led them to the individuals, that's a big, important part of the whole picture. Uh, 
and coming up with uh, using torture, it becomes they become confession compliant because they don't want the the fear anymore. They don't want the hurt, the pain, um, and that's why they give them what they want to hear. How regularly, Philip, in the heat of battle, is stuff like this used? I mean, you know, have the British done this when we were in Iraq or Afghanistan or anywhere? Well, it's not used um, by anyone that's professionally trained or who understands interrogation techniques. There have been examples um, where the British, the Americans, allied forces and other forces in the heat of the moment have, with untrained people, thought that they were doing some good um, in trying to get information out of people and actually causing much greater harm. Uh, and even in more controlled environments like Abu Ghraib in Iraq, um, there, there were issues that have led to longer term problems. But using force in any way, shape or form, and I've had to sign off interrogation techniques um, and interrogation plans yeah. in different operational theatres, you know, it, it doesn't work whenever you hurt people because they give you what they think you want to hear and you spend more time trying mm. to unpick the untruths that they're giving you just to stop the hurting than you do in using more um, recognised interrogation techniques that are well within the Geneva Conventions um, and mm. recognised by the International Committee of the Red Cross and okay. won't get any criticism. And you persuade people to work for you and with you um, and that, that works much better. Brian, what if time's of the essence, though? You've got people there who've just killed about 130 odd people in a theatre area in Russia. There may or may not be others out there. There may or may not be another pressing danger. There might be a bomb somewhere. You need to establish this very, very quickly. Brian, some people might think, you know what, just, just torture them. Yeah, well, that's you're not going to get what you want torturing anybody. Because what they refer to that as is enhanced interrogation, which basically is torture. Um, and the individuals that you go out looking for, you may get information that's bad, and you'll end up with end up interrogating them in a in a, an enhanced situation, and you'll get wrong information, and maybe even tying another individual to the same crime, and it becomes an emotional thing when you have that many people um, murdered at that uh, at that time. Yeah, OK. Now, look, Philip, one thing that really stood out to me was this. The fact that these pictures have gone public. The second you get out of the sphere of Western norms, this stuff obviously happens all the time, doesn't it? Like in Russia. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, once you lose your humanity, and I have to question why the Russians are putting this out. You know, if you look at the attack itself, um, yes, Islamic State have come in and they've admitted responsibility and they, they would do uh, and they've come in really quickly and there's never been an incident where they've admitted this level of responsibility and given the evidence that they have done mm. where they haven't been involved. However, there are other questions that we have to ask. The Russian security forces were within minutes of this concert hall. It took them over an hour to respond. Um, the Russian uh, security forces had um, weapons and capabilities inside the concert hall. It took them a long time to respond. There's, there's more to this than we know about, um, and mm. it's going to take time for that to come out if it ever does come out. But you know, getting into the position where what they're doing is they're admitting to what if it was in a, a conflict situation or war crimes, they don't seem to care about that. They're, they're trying to scare other people. They're trying to send a message out, but the message they're sending out to the international community and to those that would potentially capture mm -hmm. Russians and all the rest of it is, well, if that's what you're going to do, we're not going to show you any mercy whatsoever in the in, in the future. Uh, um, and that's yeah. not a good message to send out. No, I, I think, you know, there might be a short-term effect where it makes, look, if my loved one had just been killed in a terror attack, I might get a small amount of comfort from knowing that the person who'd done that had just had his genitals but you're causing more, you're, but, You'd be yeah. causing more problems to your loved ones. That, that's, that's the big issue. You make it more difficult to get the information that you need. Fine. Um, and this is where you have to take the emotion away from what you're doing and treat it um, from, from a, a completely non-emotional perspective. Well, well and just, just on that, Brian, as a, as a coercive interrogation expert, what kind of techniques are there that, frankly, don't involve cutting someone's ear off and making them eat it? Well, you've got your standard ones that are minimizations, maximizations, narrative integrations, uh, narrative traps. Those sorts of things are used in the domestic uh, interrogations. 
um, that have even those have been impeached now as being unreasonable. Um, the fact of the matter is, is if you're a good if you're a good interviewer, a good interrogator, and a good investigator, you'll know how to deal with the person you're dealing with, and you don't have to resort to these techniques because they're unreliable. If mm -hmm. you're acting on information they've provided, perhaps another suspect that they tell you that did it, um, distancing distancing themselves from that particular individual or the crime you may find that without the proper investigative techniques that you're using, which are inductive or deductive, um, you're not going to end up with the right person in the first place, and you'll end up with a, with going uh, targeting an individual that perhaps wasn't involved and may have been symbolism of that what occurred and thrown to the dogs, basically, as a, a decoy. Yeah, all right. Well, look, both of you, can I just say a massive thank you? I would happily have carried this on for another half an hour, but uh, I've got the front pages to get to. So that's uh, Brian Leslie there, who's a coercive interrogation expert. Philip Ingram, a former senior British military intelligence officer. Right, OK, look, so I am about to show you all of the front pages coming up. The Oki has become the latest battleground in the gender wars. So more opportunities for Noah Lynn Van Leuven. Is there any place for trans dance players in the women's game? Tonight's panel of pundits have their say. Before that, though, we will run you through the very first of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. They're coming in thick and fast. I'll see you in a sec. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Good evening to you. The rest of this week, well, be prepared for further heavy downpours and temperatures staying around about or a little bit below average. Low pressure is well and truly in control of our weather and will be for the rest of this week. These weather fronts have been making for a pretty soggy day for much of the UK. The rain across Scotland, falling of snow over the hills, that continues in the east through the night. Elsewhere, it does turn a little bit drier, uh, staying fairly cloudy and um, staying fairly chilly. Temperatures down into single figures, not far freezing in northern Scotland and small wintry showers coming into the northern and the western isles as we go into Tuesday. Still a bit more snow over the Grampians, although that should ease. Further showers, though, to come in the east coast of Scotland. Central and southern Scotland looking a little bit drier compared to today. It'll be a wetter day, though, for the southeast as that rain moves in through Tuesday and that spreads into the Midlands and rain again for Northern Ireland. But something a bit brighter in the southwest and south Wales and for eastern England, too, some glimmers of sunshine. But it is going to feel pretty chilly, particularly across Scotland, where the Rain and hill snow continues into Wednesday and then elsewhere it's bands of showers moving in. Be prepared for some heavy downpours on Wednesday. There will be some brighter spells between the heavy showers, a bit of sunshine. We'll see temperatures up to double digits, but generally feeling cooler in the breeze and plenty more of those heavy showers to come in the run up to Easter. I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight on GB News, and it is time to bring you all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. Let's do it. I've got the Independent. UK hits back over China's cyber attack on MPs and voters. Can I just say, barely. We've sanctioned two 
Total randomers and one small business. So all that's our show there. Uh, right, the eye. Uh, I've got a UK cabinet clash on how to fight China spy threat. Presumably the clash was whether we did NAFL or just a little bit. Let's go to the mail. Oh, here we go again. Beijing hacked details of 40 million voters and spied on MPs. The UK's response is compared to taking a wooden spoon to a gunfight. Good, the mail have got it. Um, the Telegraph. Secret court for speeding and TV fines must end. Oh, here we go. Magistrates call for judicial overhaul to stop vulnerable being prosecuted in private. So apparently a uh, major intervention has called for the overhaul of secretive single justice procedure, which has resulted in vulnerable people being prosecuted behind closed doors in absentia or without legal representation. That all sounds ironically a bit like China, doesn't it? The Guardian. Israel isolated after UN Security Council demands Gaza ceasefire. Yeah, there we are. Uh, the mirror, the Kate effect, huge surge in web cancer checks after Princess statement. Brave Kate has triggered a spike in web searches about cancer after speaking of her own diagnosis. And we go to the sun now again. Brave Kate saves lives. The Princess of Wales's shock revelation that she's been treated for cancer has inspired hundreds of thousands to get checked. There we go. Uh, also, a slight contrast on the front of the sun there. Cokehead's footy ban. There we are. So it's really got it all, that sun front page, hasn't it? Um, all right, now, look, I'm pleased to be joined by my press pack. We have got star columnist Carol Malone. I've got trade unionist Andy McDonald and political editor at the Daily Express, Sam Lister, um, look, I am going to get straight to a developing story. OK, so this is happening right now as we speak. Border force at Manchester Airport have been accused of discriminating against Israeli survivors of the 7th October terrorist attack. The Jewish Representative Council of Greater Manchester has demanded an urgent investigation after two Jewish Israeli passport holders who reportedly suffer from PTSD face this, quote, aggressive officer at the border. Checks we need to conduct, so okay? To Nobody's saying that. Country. Nobody has said that once. So knock the attitude off. Okay. We've made the decision and you're coming in. So just let us do the checks we need to do and keep quiet. Look at me. OK, you clear with that? Good. We're the bosses, not you. All right? Obviously, we don't know the full context of that video yet, but the allegation is that they were treated badly because of their Israeli passport. The JRC claims that the two men were detained for two hours simply because they were Israeli, and the same border officer allegedly said, we had to make sure that you're not going to do what you are doing in Gaza over here. I will just read that again, OK? The same border officer allegedly said, we had to make sure that you are not going to do what you are doing in Gaza over here. Manchester Airport is investigating the allegations and in the past few minutes, Home Secretary James Cleverly has tweeted, we are investigating this. We do not tolerate anti-Semitism or any form of discrimination. The incident will be handled in line with our disciplinary procedures. We're going to keep across that story for you. It is obviously, you know, absolutely astonishing. It is, like I've said, breaking and happening right as we speak. They are allegations, and I don't think it would be too wise for us to really comment more widely on that at the moment. So I will knock it on to another story for us at the moment. And it's Keir Starmer announcing that he will float offshore wind. But after this exclusive story from GB News, the Labour leader shouldn't be feeling too easy breezy about his plan. Energy experts have slapped a £116 billion price tag, which has sent them into a panic, saying Starmer's plan is simply not feasible. Speaking to GB News earlier, Labour Shadow Welsh Secretary Joe Stevens defended their strategy. Our plan will mean that we take back control of our national energy security, and we do that through Great British Energy, publicly owned, so the profits that are earned go back into government for the benefit of the taxpayer. Well, look, Andy, you've got to contrast that with Rishi Sunak saying he's going to quite literally go nuclear today. Are Labour just going to throw money into the wind with his energy plan? Well, not really. I mean, it does, you know, the Labour energy plan also includes nuclear. That, that's important to know. It includes, you know, getting the nuclear projects, uh, uh, is it Hinkley and Sizewell, over the line, you know, investing in small modular reactors. So it does include nuclear. It also includes a, a wider range of offshore and onshore wind uh, and solar power investments. And it creates 500,000 jobs.
Oh, oh, all right. I mean, it also, I mean, it also is totally unaffordable. And it's all to oh, really. hit working class people. The people who are in the least amount of money are going to have to pay the most to support this. This is stupid. You know, Britain, the UK produces less than 1% of the world's carbon emissions. So this rush to 2030 to net zero is completely pointless. As long as China is still building two new coal plants every week, it is the number one emitter in the world. The US is the second, India is the third. Until they get their stuff under control, what we do is not going to make a damn bit of difference. It's but we, so we need to start investing in our we own independent nations. No, we're not. Talk, talk, no, we're not. We're investing. How, how are we? Where are we? Everywhere. Look where? at the wind farms all over the country. Look at them. We're investing yeah. all the time. We produce... What? Energy say, Energy costs through the roof over the last few years. We've got no energy independence. Sam, we have less than 1% of the world's cost. Sam, does this now not, not mean, though, seriously, as people have been saying for quite a while, with Ed Miliband as the old shadow energy minister, etc., you know, uh, Labour's green plan could well bankrupt Britain. Astonishing figures. They'd have to triple the number of solar panels we've got, a fourfold increase in wind yeah. farms, uh, a 400 per cent increase in the supply chains for uh, copper, steel, all those kind of things yeah. to make these things happen. Mm. The numbers just do not stack up. And we know <laughs> Labour, they've got no money to spend. They've got no money yeah. to spend. No. They are sticking to the Conservatives. Why have we got no money to spend? They're sticking to the Conservatives' fiscal rules, uh, but coming up with ludicrous plans like this, they can't fund it from the things they've set out and they just cannot, it is impossible. You talk about all the jobs that they're going to create, those jobs don't exist if you can't pay for this, and they can't. And just think time today said, even if they manage to scrape the money together, which they won't, the plan is still entirely unfeasible by 2030. Things like the, the, the amount of steel that they're going to need, they're not going to be able to get by 2030. It's just right. well, well, you know, think tanks do say a lot of things, and if the government had yes, been supporting... Right. If they'd been supporting the steel plants, like in Port Talbot, which had just closed their last coking oven ever, you know, if they'd been supporting British Steel over the last 14 years they've been That's in government, all maybe, it would have been, maybe it would have been... Oh, uh, Finish, according, finish, finish, according, to this, according to this think tank. But think tanks say lots of things. I wouldn't okay. trust everything think tanks say. Oh, all right. Oh, go on. Finally, no, I was finally. Just say, the last Labour government could have sorted out the nuclear problem, but they didn't. They refused to invest in nuclear. As did the coalition government. Yeah, but we're talking about the Labour oh. government. But, so... but the, more, the more recent government. All right. In <laughs> fairness. Uh, let's, uh, let's turn the lights out on that discussion. Hey, <laughs> you're well, welcome, you Britain. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now. <laughs> the big I'm here all night. All right. All right. Now, Soon Dutch enough. darts athletes. <laughs> Moving on, Dutch darts athlete <laughs> Noah Lynn van Leuven made history for being the first trans athlete to win the PDC Women's Series. Let's take a look. More opportunities for Noah Lynn van Leuven. Double ten the target. Up Game for double five. She's able to pin it. Well, since then, two of her female, there, his, his, female teammates have resigned. An 18-time Grand Slam tennis champion, Martina Navratilova, has said no male bodies in women's sports, please, not even in darts. Now, Carol, does it matter in darts? Yes, it does matter because you're talking about muscle strength. Men have between 30 and 60% more muscle strength than women do anyway, which means their throw was better, tougher, whatever. I don't know about their eyes. I don't know whether their eyes were any better. But, you know, it is, there's a principle at stake here. And, and this, this transgender woman is going around winning competitions with men and with, with women. She's winning mixed ones. This is all about money for, for this mm. person. I can't say the name. I've heard your crack at it. I'm not following Van that. Van Leuven. Uh, yeah, whatever you just said. Uh, but, you know, this trans ideology is wrecking women's sport. It's not fair. And what Martina Navratilova also said, as well as no male bodies in, in, in women's sport, she said it stinks. And it really does stink. It's a big, big cheat on women, this. Uh, Sam, your view I, I, I am so fed up of this <laughs> as an issue because it, 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 it is not wrong to say that yeah, men are men women. and women are women yeah. uh, when it comes to biology. And you, you either believe in women's sport or you mm. don't. And if you don't believe in women's sport, then fine, let's scrap it and let's see men take the prizes in yeah. everything. Uh, because that's what it is reduced down to. It doesn't matter if you choose to identify in a different way. If your biology is male, you have a physical advantage. Absolutely. Oh, go on, go be honest. I mean, I, I agree broadly. You know, I think in genuinely physical sports like cycling, like swimming, like tennis, yeah, I agree. But you know, it, it is kind of darts. You know, you look at the male, uh, the male athletes in darts. They're hardly, you know, the. the 
top form of athleticism. Yeah. Normally it's a you know fat, bold guy. Like, re realistically, they throw from the same distance. I don't think men have an inherent advantage of being more specific with where they throw the darts. I, I agree with you in wider sport, but on this, I mean, it's, it's really... You know, do you believe in, in male and female categories generally in sport? Yeah. So why is this different? Because it's I don't think it's a really physically based sport. I don't think it's, there's an inherent advantage to men over women. Do you think, <laughs> you think we, women have a right to choose who they play with? Or do we have to accept men deciding who we play with? I, I'm sure that there's many women in the women's PDC board that have made this decision. I don't think it no, is just a lot, men I'm who afraid have made a lot of the women's the man who decides. It's the man who decides. This. And you know, and Sam makes a very good point, you know, it is not transphobic. What we're saying, no, it's pro, I, I, it's pro women. I haven't and said that's that. That's the point. No, it's no I didn't say you did. I didn't but say that. I'm talking about Sam's point. It's not transphobic. It's pro women. It's pro women's rights. It's pro their right to compete right. with other women to compete on a level playing field. And this is not a level playing field. You just have to look at the, the difference between the size and the the mm. women that were playing. And Patrick, do the name. Van Leuven. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that in, and I'm not going to call call Van Leuven mm. a her either because no. it's just not fair. It's not. It's not the women who are saying we want right. to play against men. They it's don't. the men saying we right. want to play yes. in your category. Well, well woe betide me to interrupt two women on this particular <laughs> topic, but I am going to have to. I'm afraid. Look, coming up as a royal expert claims that Harry and Meghan were not told about Princess of Wales's cancer diagnosis. Is it time? the royal family to let bygones be bygones. Find out more as I crown tonight's greatest Britain and Union jackass. But next, I will take you to Paris to show you the restaurant racing phenomenon taking the French capital by storm. It's Patrick Christie's tonight. We're on GB News. Tubes and Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m. Do you think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future, and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this, is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous to well, destroy would our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And, in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a primer <laughs> stove and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always looking ahead. Uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country? All right, welcome back. It's time to return to the first of the front pages. Let's do it. I've got the Times. China set to be declared a threat to national security. Yeah, all right, brilliant. Um, they've also got the convoy of tractors blocking roads outside Parliament. A farmer's protest came to Parliament today. The Daily Express. Tory MPs, we now must label China a threat to Britain. Britain turns a blind eye to Beijing's malign activities, says Sir Ian Duncan Smith. And it's true. We absolutely do. Big picture of Esther McVeigh. Esther McVeigh urges councils to fix our nation's roads. Get on with it, she says. Good for her. We like Esther McVeigh. Fair now, the word, they weren't cutting local government funding. If only, well, if only local governments weren't spending it on diverse nonsense. Now, I'm joined again by my press pack, Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, trade unionist Annie McDonald, and political editor at The Express, Sam Lister. Now, the SNP have been warned 
far and wide that their controversial new hate crime law will have a chilling effect on free speech. But they're not even bothered, OK? They could criminalise things you say in your own home to your own relatives over dinner. Just listen to Scottish First Minister Hamza Youssef defending the legislation. In terms of incidents and hate crime incidents, it's important that they are recorded because what it does is it gives police an idea of where there might be spikes in hatred. That behaviour might not be criminal, but they can then see a pattern that is simply done so police can see if there's a rise in anti-Semitism, for example, or a rise in uh, homophobia uh, right, right across the country. It's important that police are able to monitor any patterns of hatred that might emerge. So, the behaviour might not be criminal, but we'll call the police anyway. Very concerning stuff, Carol. It's very concerning. You, know, you would think he had nothing else to think about. You mm. know, Scotland is a basket case currently. His health services in a mess, education services in a mess. You know, he promised he was going to change all that when he came to power. He's done nothing. The, the economy's a mess, and he's talking about non-hate hate crime. I mean, it's just stupidity. I mean, you there's know. a serving there's a serving Scottish MSP who's a Tory up there who said something along the lines of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, being non-binary is like, you know, you've got no more right to say that than you've got to say that I'm a cat or something. I'm paraphrasing what he said there. And police investigated that. I mean, surely they've got better stuff on, Andy. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they do. And I'm, I'm glad that that, you know, Murdo Fraser, the Tory MSP, you know, he's seeking the support of his trade union. He's going to the free speech union. Yeah, so I'm very, very happy for him there. Um, but I, I think, you know, it's a bit... You know, they shouldn't be going after him, but it's bizarre that he'd say it. Like, what, if you're a serving MP, why would you compare being non binary to identifying as a cat? Serve your constituents, man. I think the concern for me, anyway, Sam, is you know, you, you're having Christmas dinner, Nan's round, yeah. Nan's got some views, right? <laughs> Nan's and, 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 and the 17 year old at the dinner table yeah. who's been through the work education system thinks this is appalling, so has to call the police, and then it turns yourself into a family of snitches and you've ripped apart the nuclear family. This, this is the most sinister policy development in the UK. I can remember in a long time and, you know, there's a lot of competition, let's be fair. Um, but this is essentially the, the, the kind of real-life embodiment of the Big Brother 1984 George Orwell warnings, that, you know, from decades ago. People snooping on each other, snitching on each other. It is like kind of East Berlin in the, uh, in the height of the mm. Cold War. And I think this is a real... Um, it's a real shame because it, it is the kind of last refuge of the desperate politician, isn't it? Let's hide... Um, behind oh, all this yeah. as a kind of diversion when, as Carol says, the schools are going to pot, the health services under pressure, etc, etc. And I think, actually, the police should be investigating crimes. Yeah. Why are we putting all these things onto the police all the time? Social work, thought crimes, why are they not investigating yeah, burglaries? The things he's mentioned there as well, because there's already laws against that stuff. There are already laws against anti-Semitism. There would already be laws against homophobia, etc. I mean, they, those things already exist. And there is, I am convinced, there's no real clamour from people now saying, you need to police what's happening in my own home. Um, look, I'm going to take you now to uh, Paris. So you're welcome. All right, we're yes. off to Paris, everybody. So 200 Parisian waiters have taken part in the annual tray-carrying race after a 13-year hiatus. Each waiter had to hold a croissant, a cup of coffee and a glass of water on their tray for two kilometres <laughs> and could not spill a drop. Shall we see how they got on? Cheater. There you go. He cheated with a lot of clamour in the studio. <laughs> Plus, the guys years ago were running faster and they had a bottle of wine as well yeah. as the glass of fig. That's yeah. a cheat, yeah. Well, it's all right. It doesn't really matter because they went on strike halfway through that anyway. <laughs> so, uh, there we are. <laughs> Lazy trope, everybody. Now, OK, time to reveal today's greatest Britain Union jackass. Now then, Carol, your greatest Briton, please. I don't, I don't really like, I, this is the whole of the royal family. Okay. Uh, two of its much loved members are now suffering from and being treated for cancer. The rest of the royal family are rallying round to do the duty of the ones who aren't able to work at the moment. And, you know, I think that's incredible at a time when, you know, they're suffering what millions of other families in this country are suffering, but they have other duties as well, and they're doing them. They're, we've seen more of Edward the past two weeks in Sophie than I have in years, and they're all doing their bit, which I think is very and, so you're, and all for our sakes. So you've gone for the whole royal family? Apart from Harry, obviously. <laughs> well, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Prince Andrew? Um, 
Oh, I <laughs> Anyone else you want to get on? Anyone? <laughs> you crossing anyone else on the list? No, you're right. Yeah, pardon, nope. yeah. All right, OK, good. Right, go on, Andy, your greatest Britain. Uh, my greatest Britain uh, was Britons. Uh, the UN Security Council, they've passed a resolution for uh, demanding a ceasefire in Gaza until the end of Ramadan. You know, I know it's, it's flying in and out of the news, the kind of mm. uh, crisis in Israel, and I think it is important that we are trying to find a humanitarian solution. It's interesting you mentioned this, actually, yes, because uh, this broke earlier today, didn't it? It's on the front of The Guardian, I think it is, Actually, yeah. um, which is Israel as I isolated, just that's the yeah. one. Israel isolated after U.S. Security Council demands mm. Gaza ceasefire. So the U.S. abstained on this, mm. didn't they? Which just mark a shift, okay? Yeah. But the U.K. and 13 other members did call for a lasting end to the conflict. I, uh, I think it's that kind of evolution into uh, going down into the Rafa in the south, where a lot of civilians are, and there's kind of pending military offensives there. So mm. I think even the U.S. are kind of going, ah, we do have to think. But yeah, but then you saw Kamala Harris. She was going, hey, I've studied the maps, okay, and there's. There's nowhere for these guys to go. I mean, there is. There's Egypt. I mean, there Egypt is. aren't taking them. In yeah, well, they oh, the well, you know, so they there can't we go. physically get them. I wonder why. Fact. Anyway, all right. Um, go on then, Sam. Who's your greatest person? Well, Bob Wilson, known to your viewers, I'm sure, for being a sporting legend. But actually, there's a, an interview in the Telegraph today. It's very powerful where he talks about uh, six months ago losing his wife, mm. Megs. Uh, they've been together for 70 years. Oh my God. And they lost their daughter when she was only 31. Um, to cancer and set up a foundation, the Willow Foundation. And so it's to, to him and his wife for the good works they did for charity over that very long period. Lovely. Oh, well, OK. All right. Well, uh, today's greatest Britain is... Obviously, it's the royal family, because that's just the way it's <laughs> oh, going to have to be, I'm afraid. But not, yes. but not Andrew or Harry. But <laughs> not Andrew or Harry. No. Neither of them are coming to Carol's birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> Carol, who is your union jackass, please? Oh, it's Shamima Begum. She's lost her bid. Um, she's lost her, her challenge. Uh, ch uh, I'll start again. Yeah. She wanted to go to the Supreme Court. She lost her appeal court um, appeal last month to, to have her citizenship renewed. She wanted to go to the Supreme Court. Thank God common sense has, has prevailed and she's been told no, which is good because this girl has tried nine times now to get her citizenship back. It's cost us a fortune in legal aid. If she'd got her citizenship back, uh, she, it was taken away because she joined the murderous um, death called ISIS and did whatever she did over there. But, you know, if she got it back, it's, she's never going to be able to work in this country. We'd have to support her for all of her life. And we're going to, and MI5 are going to be looking at her 24 hours, 24-7. So that means that she's going to cost us multi-millions. Good. I think she'd also become a jihadi pin-up, wouldn't she? I mean, we'd learn a lot about certain what? communities. <laughs> yeah, she would. And we'd learn a lot about certain communities in Britain where you know, they would absolutely be out on the streets celebrating the return of Jamima Begum. But, uh... and the, you know, the security services say the women returnees are every bit as dangerous as the men. Mm. So that's that's. Go on, Andy. Who's your who's your union jackass? Union jackass this week is Owen Jones. You know, oh, he's, oh uh, yes, he's, yes. Uh, oh. over the last couple of days, he's We're quit the Labour party. party. You know, to, to our disappointment, to our disappointment, he's quit the Labour Party. He's started off this new weird, bizarre little faction thing that he's doing, and then he did that dreadful interview with Lewis Goodall. Honestly, I, I've even disappointed myself that I'm giving him more media attention. He's a little kind of Peter Pan wannabe. He needs to get out of our screens. <laughs> you know what I mean? Really dislike the boy. <laughs> I think Carol might endorse this one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that one. Owen Jones, Owen Jones, Owen Jones isn't here to defend himself. <laughs> I would like to just make no, that. He's in Neverland. I don't make know where he's going. And, um, and still it continues. We normally get you on to offer the balance here when it comes to the Labour stuff, and here I am doing it. But there we go. Right, well, apparently Owen Jones is, uh, is, is a strong contender. Go on, here's your Sam. Um, Police Scotland, we've just been discussing the case, Murdo Fraser, they uh, recorded his tweet about uh, being non-binary, being, like, identifying yourself as a cat. Mm. Um, they recorded that as a non-hate, a non-crime hate incident. Yeah. Oh, Murdo Fraser God. only found this out by accident when uh, it was also reported to the Scottish Parliament with a crime reference number, and that's how he found out that he'd been reported to the police. Um, so, yeah. Police Scotland for investigating not. No, I agree. I agree with you on it because I, I think it's just a very, very dangerous slippery slope. Today's Union Jackass. Shamima Bega. Oh, good. Oh, okay. Oh, two for two. Yeah, two for two. Be honest with you. Be honest with you. I thought it was Police Scotland, but there we go. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be back tomorrow for 9 p.m. It's headliners next. Take it easy, people. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News.
This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Good evening to you. The rest of this week, well, be prepared for further heavy downpours and temperatures staying around about or a little bit below average. Low pressure is well and truly in control of our weather and will be for the rest of this week. These weather fronts have been making for a pretty soggy day for much of the UK. The rain across Scotland, falling of snow over the hills, that continues in the east through the night. Elsewhere, it does turn a little bit drier, uh, staying fairly cloudy and um, staying fairly chilly. Temperatures down into single figures, not far freezing in northern Scotland and small wintry showers coming into the northern and the western isles as we go into Tuesday. Still a bit more snow over the Grampians, although that should ease. Further showers, though, to come on the east coast of Scotland. Central and southern Scotland looking a little bit drier compared to today. It'll be a wetter day, though, for the southeast as that rain moves in through Tuesday and that spreads into the Midlands and rain again for Northern Ireland. But something a bit brighter in the southwest and south Wales and for eastern England, too, some glimmers of sunshine. But it is going to feel pretty chilly, particularly across Scotland where the rain and hill snow continues into Wednesday and then elsewhere it's bands of showers moving in. Be prepared for some heavy downpours on Wednesday. There will be some brighter spells between the heavy showers, a bit of sunshine. We'll see temperatures up to double digits but generally feeling cooler in the breeze and plenty more of those heavy showers to come in the run-up to Easter. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. Seriously couldn't get my head around it. Electric ambulances. The government are planning to spend our money, over half a billion, on a fleet of electric net zero ambulances. Even being told this alarm bell should be ringing, most of the people I know who have an EV have got rid of it because of the range anxiety and the inconvenience having simply just got too much for them, frankly. They never do as much as they say they won't, will anyway. First of all, they are totally impractical. The ambulances will take some four hours to charge each, so it will be out of action for that time. They will need space and individual chargers and having, and heaven forbid, they need to do more than the 70 to 80 miles capability, which will be somewhat diminished depending on weather conditions and presumably the use of life-saving equipment to keep their patients alive, which I'm guessing will be powered by the same battery. Apparently, the NHS is committed to making all new emergency ambulances electric by 2030 and the entire fleet by 2045. In England alone, this would cost over £600 million. While 